Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to another episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I am your host, Dr. Jake Porter, and I'm glad you are here. Today, we're going to talk about when addicts don't want the help they need. You know, it's not unusual for those who have just been discovered uh, in their sex addiction or their chronic betrayal to resist the very steps that aren't just for the safety and stability of their betrayed partner, but for themselves as well and for the recovery of their relationship. Today, I'm going to be joined by Tiffany Kaminsky, an APSAT certified partner coach uh, based out of Florida who works with folks from around the country and even around the world. And we're going to talk about what to do when an addict doesn't want the help they need. Uh, Before I introduce her, uh, though she is no stranger to the show, she's been on before, Uh, Before I remind you of who she is, let me tell you about a couple of other things though that are really important that you may want to be a part of. APSATS, the sponsor of this uh, podcast here, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, um, has its its, uh, foundational training, its its keystone training, the multidimensional partner trauma model training coming up. They've got two dates scheduled for it. There's going to be one that begins November the 8th, uh, it'll be a fall offering, and then another offering that will happen in the new year starting January 20th. If you are a helping professional, you're a therapist, you're a coach, and you believe that you might want to begin working more or working more effectively with those who have experienced betrayal, I would highly encourage you to take this amazing training. It's a four-day training Uh, You can find out all about it at appsats.org. The link will be in the show notes um, below. And uh, then one other thing I want to let you know about is something I'm hosting, a fully online, completely free summit called the Couples Boundaries Summit. The Couples Boundaries Summit. And uh, I'm going to be joined by five other professionals in this field, amazing folks uh, who will all share different facets of what boundaries are, how to set them, um, what what we need to look for in boundaries. All of these sorts of issues are going to be brought up during that completely free online summit, which will be held on September the 17th. If you would like to sign up to get a free pass to that summit, you can do so at Boundaries Summit. That's boundaries, plural, B-O-U-N-D-A-R-I-E-S summit.com. Uh, the link to that will also be in the show notes below. Okay, we're going to talk to Tiffany. Tiffany was on with us a couple months ago, based out of Central Florida. Tiffany Kamiski is uh, a certified life coach, partner trauma coach, early couples empathy recovery coach, and uh, practices internationally. She certifies with, with APSATS. And she uses a gentle yet effective approach to tackle the emotional and physical pain of betrayal trauma and or abuse, and is an expert at providing much-needed support and tools in an empathetic way to those who uh, desperately need it. Uh, She's a survivor of childhood and adult compound trauma herself, and so she really understands the frustration of trying to find a professional to help navigate through the pain uh, when they just don't seem to understand. Tiffany believes that finding a professional who is specifically trained and certified in betrayal trauma is a key to proper healing. I couldn't agree with her more. Her coaching style is derived from the International Coach Federation, uh, in which she allows her clients the space to be able to really discover their hidden gifts and their own uh, um, guide to the tools and the confidence that they need to overcome the consequences of betrayal. So uh, join me now in this conversation with Tiffany about what to do when addicts don't want the help they need. Welcome, Tiffany. Thanks, Jake. Good to see you again. 
Yes, thanks for coming back to Betrayal Recovery Radio. It's good to have you here. Yes, so um, you, you know, so you're not a, a stranger to our audience by any means, but uh, I've done your formal bio. What what do people really need to know about you, though? Uh, what mm. that's not on the official bio, you think? Just to get to know who you are. Yeah, you know, when I when I meet with a client, that's the first thing I do is I want them to feel safe and um, know me a little bit before I just jump in and um, start digging away at, with uh, questions. So thanks for asking. Of course. I am a um, betrayal trauma specialist. I started this business a few years ago um, and was specifically um, geared towards helping her, just working with her, um, mostly triage, getting everybody, most of my clients were coming to me pretty quick after discovery. And so I was doing more triage work and um, trying to figure out how to empower her and how to help her heal, working with tools, um, trying to just get her um, to be able to cope day to day. So that's that was my initial um, coaching experience. After a while, I uh, started learning that it's so much better mm. to um, be able to bring the husband in or the partner, or I should say it, it could be a husband or wife, whatever. Sure. I say right. for easy husband, um, to bring him in on the recovery process. Um, cause often I would get the, the partner and she was so traumatized, but had no plan whatsoever. And that included, what do I do with him and how do I feel safe with him? So I, now moving forward, um, I, uh, have gotten multiple certifications in communication, uh, coaching and, um, Urkum, which is the, the newest early recovery, even though it's been out a year, early recovery couple, couples empathy model, really right. getting the couple together um, and formulating a plan uh, day one on how this is going to work as far as helping the rela relationship heal. Um, and in turn, both partners obviously are going to be doing their own work. So I usually work with just the partner doing her recovery work, but then I also do the couple's work. Um, and I do a lot of coaching with him as well to try to teach him how to be empathetic with what, okay. what she's going through. So full spectrum now, yeah. but um, my passion really is to just help the couple. Um, that's great. You know, okay. Save some families. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, thank you. And I know that, I know that you're a, a real gift to those who, uh, come to you for your services. Mm -hmm. So let's just jump right in. So we're talking today about when addicts don't want the help they need to heal, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. So let's start out with a scenario. Let's say a betrayed partner comes to you and um, the betraying partner has been in some some form of recovery, some version of recovery, but is mm -hmm. but the betrayed partner who comes to you is frustrated with the mentality uh, of that she's getting or he's getting from the one who did the betraying of why can't you just get over it? Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about my past. Haven't we gone over this before? Uh, I, I've already told you, look, I'm not that way anymore. Um, where do you start with that? It's pretty common, pretty common yeah, struggle. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, really, really common. Um, that's the probably number one biggest obstacle. Uh, and that's why I do empathy coaching. Um, mm. so when somebody comes to me and they're like, you know, I know that you're working with her to get healthy. I know that, that she's doing all this work, but it's not working. Whatever you're doing isn't working. And it's been a month, <laughs> or a two month. Or three months. I'm just Ooh. like, okay, well, listen, this is why you have to understand that when there's a trauma and I go into this whole whole science class thing and I go into the brain and what has happened to her and how um, it has really made her question her life. Um, what is reality? She doesn't know what it is anymore because what she thought was real isn't real, obviously. So yeah. when I'm talking to him um, and I, I always start with a little bit of you know empathy for him. I, I understand you want to move past this. 
if you're doing your work and you're getting healthy and you want to be, uh, you know, you just want to move on with your life. I get it. I totally a hundred percent respect that. However, unfortunately, the way betrayal, bet, that betrayal trauma works, it's more like a, a roller coaster. And you're going to be up here. You might be up here for a while in your recovery, but you've got to remember, this is so significant. She's staying down here. Mm. And in order for you both to move and, and grieve and, and go through this process together, you got to come down here and you mm. got to help her back up. And what that means for you is you have to be the one to hold her hand when she's hurting. You're the one that hurt her more than most likely more than anybody's hurt her in her entire life. But the good news is you can rebuild that intimacy or sometimes start it from the ground up just by being there for your partner and helping her heal. And, um, and that usually does it, um, more likely than not, they're like, okay, I get it. What do I need to do? Sign me up. If I have a partner mm-hmm. that's or a, an addict or the one who's betrayed is the one saying, okay, I get it. And I, I want her to move forward. Um, that's what I call the buy-in. They're ready to do the work to help. Uh, but most of them don't come to the table knowing that this is going to be a long process. Most of them have no idea um, the level of trauma this, this can cause her. And, uh, most yeah. of them don't think it's going to last as long as it does. And it just, it does, it can last for years. So right. he can help them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I've seen the same thing, especially around that education piece that you talked about. Mm-hmm. Sometimes just helping people understand the traumatic nature of betrayal, that this is like yeah. a real trauma in the brain. This is not, yeah you know, obsession. It's not mm-hmm. like a forgiveness. It's not, you know, rumination. This is a primal safety seeking response after someone's exactly. history has been blown up. Yeah. Safety is the number one thing that we work on. Uh, you and I in this business, Yeah, we know that we can't go anywhere without that safety. So That's safety right. has to be established. And yeah. uh, on that first session with the couple, I always try to bring him in on if not the first session, at least the second session, um, right up front, I say, you know, she's got to feel safe. And if if you can't be on board with the plan and helping her feel safe, then that means I have to do that with her and she's going to have to do it on her own. And when she has to do that on her own without your help, that means she's going through this grieving process alone. Which is not good news for you, buddy. Not good news. <laughs> that means she, right. you know, she's going to build up resentment more than likely. She's yeah. not going to just move on and forget. Uh, what will happen is she moves on because she's stronger and she's got help and support. Um, but if she has to move on and you're not there to go with her at the same pace or at least try, um, that resentment is going to build and she's going to more than likely end up leaving. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is so important, what we're talking about here and to sort of frame it up in the uh, using the APSATS model, the multidimensional Mm -hmm. partner trauma model. Mm -hmm. uh, There are three phases in the APSATS model, right? Phase one is about safety and stability. Phase two is about mourning and loss, that grief work that you're talking Mm -hmm. about. And then phase three is where we get into post-traumatic growth. And and what I hear you saying, and I think it's so dead on, I, I share this with my couples as well, that grief is really where the healing happens. It's a, Mm. it's a hard process, but it's where the healing happens. And it's also very transformative. And so if you're going to remain in relationship, you need to move through that process together, be changing together. Right. But you can't do that. If there's not safety first, grief is a luxury for the brain that knows it's safe. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. and so that's why, going back, being patient, being, having that empathy so that the partner can know the, the what's first. And then once all the what's are in place, now let's move into the why's, which is that grief work. Yeah. So, yeah, so speaking yeah. of safety, let me ask you this. What are some ways that the betrayed partner early on can effectively communicate those needs for safety? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, good question. They are, um, like I said before, that's their primal need. 
whether they know it or not, it's, it's for safety. Um, so that's the, for one of the very first things, if not the first thing that we work on, that's their homework day one, is to figure out what it is that you need for safety. Um, and what I've been doing with couples work lately, which is working out great, is that if I have a buy-in from him, I'll actually ask him, you know, what do you think that she might need? And get mm. his ideas, because it's easier for him to buy in if he's coming up with some ideas as well. But for her, with or without him, we established sort of a list. What do you need? What do you need for safety? Yeah. Um, the first part of the list has got to be, you know, you can't be acting out anymore. And what is relapse? Define relapse. What does that look like for you? And we just lay it out. We mark it. Um, and then the second part is just a list of requests, which uh, is could include things like, um, you know, a tracker on his phone so she knows where he's at. Um, maybe he has um, a rule of never being alone with a female, never being in his office with the door closed with a female. Um, several examples and we just, we list them out. What, what's going to help you know, for the most part that he is trying to keep you safe. Um, and then the last part is what are some healthy things that you could see him doing that might show you that he's actually doing the work? Um, that could be as easy as checking in with me every day, talking to me every day, uh, checking in with me weekly and let me know how recovery is going. Keep me posted. Um, invite me into one of your therapist meetings. You come to one of my meetings. Um, let's do some couples work. Uh, let's uh, have some exercise plan in there, some good healthy eating habits, some work life balance. Whatever it is that's healthy is also going to be on this plan. And those things that she's working on, that safety plan can actually be incorporated in, into his recovery plan. So she feels like she has some kind of um, uh, word, some kind of, um, eye on what's going on in his recovery. Um, one of the things that can get in the way, but just for a tiny bit is sometimes he looks at the recovery plan and goes, Oh no, 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 no. She can't control this. <laughs> right. She's not I was gonna just going to ask you that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? She's not going to tell me what to do. My eating, what is what is my diet yeah. and me doing healthy well, eating yeah. have to do yeah. with her safety around my acting <laughs> yeah. out? Which hey she's just fair question. To tell me what to do. Fair yeah. question though. I mean, let's exactly. really take that on. Let's help people understand that because yeah. I've I've encountered that before too, right? Yeah. Even yeah. from professionals who don't really understand betrayal and betrayal trauma, <laughs> right? Oh. Shouldn't we be helping that person focus on themselves? Shouldn't we be uh, um and yes, you yeah, should. Yeah, so so what do you what would you say to that? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there are still professionals out there that think that way. Um, it's more of a modern way of thinking, the way you and I think, Jake, is bringing her on board, going through that grieving process together includes letting her be able to see what he's doing in recovery. It is not control. It has nothing to do with controlling him. Maybe a little bit of control for herself because he's had 100% control and power during the whole time he's been acting out. He's the only one that knew what was going on. He's been keeping secrets. Everything's been held from her. Now she feels like she needs to grasp onto something to know that she's safe. So the new way of thinking is we're doing this together as a couple. And that means her knowing a little bit about what's going on with his recovery work. Doesn't mean she needs to go into all his meetings and tell a therapist what to do with her husband. It, that's not what that's about. It's all about just her feeling safe, her feeling like, okay, at least I know what's going on. I didn't know what was going on for the last 20 years, but now right. I do because he's communicating with me. Right, exactly. Yeah, you know, I, one of the things that I, when I've had these conversations with colleagues who don't see it the same way, who don't understand yeah. that the way we're talking about yeah. Tiffany is yeah. I've said, well, you know, that works, that mm -hmm. idea of like, just have her focus on herself and not mm -hmm. worry about anything he's doing that works. But what, what is 
the end result of that for the relationship? What kind of relationship yeah. is it where these sorts of daily things don't actually have an impact on the dynamic between us and on my f- sense of intimacy, security, safety, connection with you, right? So if, if we're if, if both people, if both the one who did the betraying and the one betrayed are saying that one of their goals, one of their treatment goals is to save the relationship, w- well, don't we have to factor that dynamic into questions like, what are the boundaries of her safety? Because if she's going to remain open and vulnerable and emotionally connected to this person, um, that's, that's going to require something of that person, too. Right. That it wouldn't if they're just if we're just going to do loving deta- detachment. That was the term from the 80s and 90s that a lot of yes. partners were told. Right. Yeah, you just yeah. need to yeah. lovingly detach. That yeah. sounds yeah. awful for oh, a marriage. Yeah. <laughs> all the therapists that are like, Tiffany, what are you doing? <laughs> Why does she have to know what he's doing with his recovery work? And I'm like, OK, I have to explain. And then usually they're like, oh, that makes sense. OK. And usually. The sure. Best- that's not the majority. No, majority it's not. Of them nowadays understand that that's what it's like. But um, but sometimes yeah. you'll get one that is maybe they're just not informed with betrayal trauma. Right. Um, or they don't have some recent right. education around it. It's not their fault. They're doing the best with what they had before. Sure. Um, but I, I try my best to educate them. And um, usually, yeah, they, they see it. They get it. Um, right. But yeah. Which yeah. this is a, a great place to plug the... Uh, directory on the AppSats website. You can go to oh, AppSats.org yes. and there's a directory of therapists and coaches there who are mm-hmm. trained and who are certified by AppSats. Tiffany's one of them. I'm one of yeah. them, but you can find us all over the world mm-hmm. really and uh, find yeah. people who understand this stuff uh, on, on the beginning, you know, at the beginning of the process. But, you know, and also though, something else that came up as you were sharing that Tiffany for me is to be fair, um, mm-hmm. partners can as part of the trauma reaction, if they're biotemperamentally more over-controlled, they can, as a trauma reaction, move into controlling behaviors. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. even if that happens, that doesn't ne- ne- uh, negate the fact that mm-hmm. there is a level of transparency that is healthy and right and good. And that's where yeah. they can do their work with a coach or a therapist trying to yeah. parse that out. What is healthy Absolutely. and for my good and for the good of the, the relationship that I'm trying to save versus what's really not that helpful to me. Right. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times they're looking, that's what they're doing is they're looking for that safety. Um, and it could come across as well and actually can be defined as being controlling. Um, and then usually when that starts to happen, if I'm the one working with the partner, now I've had it, both ways. I've worked with the addict teaching him how to do um, empathy and how to uh, understand her trauma. And I have another therapist or coach working with her. Um, and then we, you know, and then I do the couples work. So I've had it both ways. Mm-hmm. But usually, if I'm the one working with her and I can sense, um, it's usually pretty easy to see if she is uh, just leaning on that. Um, safety plan for a hundred percent safety and not working on her right. own stuff that could be bad as well. So there has to be a fine balance and it takes a lot of patience on her end with herself, a lot of grace, but also open-mindedness and being willing to try something different yes. by yes. trusting yourself. You know what to watch for, you know what to look for. And now we're going to get strong on you're going to get strong. You're going to be the one that's going to empower yourself. You're going to be able to have a voice again. You're going to feel like you have the power. Um, it's not this, he's got all the power and now you don't. It's, right. it's more even now. So we, I do a lot of work regarding empower, empowerment regardless of the safety plan. That's like big, 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 big for me is making sure that she feels like she can stand on her own two feet. Mm. It just doesn't matter what he's doing. Yeah. We want him to come on board. We want him to do what it takes to feel safe. But what if he doesn't? What right. if he chooses not to? What if he's just checking the boxes for a little bit and then comes back and you're getting the same attitude, the same behaviors before? Yeah. Then what? Then what do you do? So if you don't start in the beginning with that empowerment, um, with really understanding what you need as a human being, 
somebody who deserves value and deserves to be loved and cherished, if you're not learning that, if you're not learning techniques and skills um, to develop that way of thinking, and he comes around in six months, he's not doing the things on your safety plan, then you're just relying on that and you're getting right back into that cycle, that negative cycle of abuse. And we don't want that. So empowerment is huge. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's, that's really good. So I want to kind of back up. I want to do a little sort of summary work because people listening, yeah. we've said a whole lot so far. And uh -huh. I think on the, on the topic of, you know, like when an addict doesn't want the help they need, I think one mm -hmm. of the things you're saying right here, and so tweak it if I'm not exactly representing you correctly, but it's almost like you're saying, Hey buddy, um, she's going to seek safety one way or another. You'd yeah. rather be part of that process than not. Right. Absolutely. Like, like, like be interested in her safety plan, show yeah. some, some, um, some, not just interest in it, but commitment to it. Mm -hmm. Right. Demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and even mm -hmm. take some of it and let it re inform your recovery plan. Right. Yeah. 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 It, again, it's that, uh, that couple work, you know, if you're not involved in helping her feel safe, then guess what? Guess who she's not going to feel safe with. And if right. she's doing the empowerment, but she doesn't feel safe with you, then then chances are six months, a year down the road, she's going to go, you know, I'm feeling great, but you don't make me feel safe. And so I'm going to just have to move on without you. Mm. So I always tell the guys all the time and, and usually in the first session, I'll say, you know, when I'm trying to get that buy-in from him, I'm like, you either need to get on board with this and really doing, having that mentality of I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the mentality of I'm going to do whatever it takes, then that next step, which is follow through, isn't going to happen. The follow through is the hard part, but you got to make the decision. It's like step one and 12 steps. You know, right. you got to decide That's right. you have a problem and you need to fix it. This is right. the same thing. I got a problem. I'm admitting it. I want to do what it takes. And her safety and security is more important to me than anything. Yeah, that's good. They have to make that choice. They have to make that decision. Otherwise, she's going to get strong. She's going to move on. Yeah, I've seen that happen yeah. as well. And and you yeah. mentioned this earlier, but I want to circle back to it and spend a little more time just focusing on this specifically. This mentality that that some folks unfortunately have, some addicts unfortunately have like, my recovery is my recovery. <laughs> you don't need to work my recovery for me. Um, which there's a, there, right. There's a, there's a yeah. good kernel in to. that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I do course. need to own, own it. it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I need to own it. But yes. what would you say to, to some guy who's really having uh, problems with that, that mentality? Yeah. That, yeah. So I love it when they want to own it. <laughs> like, please yeah. own it. Take yeah. it. Yeah, you're right. Want, it is yours. I mean, take it. We don't want her to have to babysit and tell you what mm. to do. That is not the goal here. So if he's sitting there saying, you know, this is my recovery, quit telling me what to do and you're controlling everything. To me, that signals that one, he's probably got some shame he's dealing with mm. where it, that shame is getting in the way of him being empathetic and leaning into her because he doesn't want to hear what she has to say. And two, it could also be some leftover abuse. Maybe like you can't control me. I'm the one that's supposed to control. Remember, I'm the one that does the abusing. I'm the one that controls. You can't come in here and tell me what to do. There could be some of that left. Um, or it could just be, he's just stubborn. <laughs> I mean, it could be a number of reasons, Sure. but I always stick with the bottom line. You have a choice husband or addict or a betrayer or even the wife, you, you have a choice here. Mm. You, you can take the reins and I do want you to take the reins. It's so important that you take the reins on your recovery. However, she knows what to watch for. She knows what's right and wrong. She's not going to be blindsided anymore. That is over. She is never, ever going back to the way things were. Never. It will never happen again. So as long as she's working with me, she's going to have a voice and she's going to be empowered and she's going to get stronger. And so you want to be a part of that? Do you want to help me help her? Let's work yeah. as a team. I can show you how to do that. 
part of it means you have to communicate. You got to let her know what you're doing and what you're learning so that she feels confident that it's not going to, you're not going to hurt her again. That's right. all she wants. She wants to make sure you're not going to hurt her again. I don't have very many clients actually could probably count maybe one or two. If that who have left the marriage because of the betrayal, that's not why they leave. They leave the wife leaves right. because he's not doing the work. He's not helping her feel safe. He's not letting her into his recovery life. He's not telling her what's going on. She builds up frustration. She builds up resentment, builds up resentment, and she leaves because she's not safe. That's the reason they leave. That and more lies. If he continues sure. to lie, which sure. is part of safety as well. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course. And you know, um, I'll just I'll just add to, I mean certainly ditto everything you just said and I'll add to it as well something that I often try to help addicts see especially if they're already involved in a pretty solid recovery program you know there's a lot of research on why 12 step programs work like what is it about yeah. them that makes them work and it comes down to two things usually number one is that in that relationship they have with a sponsor mm -hmm. they're completely honest like mm. There's this, this, right, this idea of rigorous honesty, yes. and they have to tell yes. their sponsor everything. So all of a sudden, there's yeah. someone in their lives who knows everything. And then the yeah. second thing is that they're told is like, you have to prioritize your recovery. Now, what mm. that means, if you were to operation, like, what does that mean? Prioritize? Well, what is typically meant by that is nothing comes before you going to meetings meeting with your sponsor right doing your step mm -hmm. work that kind of stuff so Absolutely. you're you're prioritizing relationships outside of yourself something beyond yourself <laughs> that's hard for them it is but, but here's <laughs> here's what i want to say like so really what what it boils down to what the reason why 12 step programs work it seems is that there's someone you're being completely honest with and you're prioritizing yeah. relationships beyond yourself. Why can't you do yeah. that in your marriage? Amen, Jake. I mean, oh, why, <laughs> you know, those people, I see them, well, depending on how many meetings I go to, you know, mm. three hours a week, four hours a week. If I'm doing 90 and 90, maybe I see them seven hours a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Add in some stuff. But how many hours a week am I with my partner, my wife, right? Yeah. yeah. How much faster, deeper, can my recovery go if I take the two things that are actually working mm -hmm. and exercise them with the most important relationship in my life? Yeah. So and why do you think not to flip around this yeah. <laughs> on you, but why do you think that he doesn't want to come home and do the same thing with his wife? I suppose. Why is it easier for him to tell a stranger or yeah. newly formed buddy in 12 step? Why right. is it easier for him to tell that guy, as opposed to coming home and owning things with his wife. I think, I think it's twofold. Oh, go. Yeah. No, yeah. no, go ahead. I think it's twofold. We I think number think one, same. yeah. Number one is I think that, um, she matters a lot more than any of those other dudes. Right. And so there's a shame element, a fear element of, right. Fear. Like if mm -hmm. she really knows, I think that that's huge fear wrapped up yeah. in shame and all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then another thing though, is that. I, th I genuinely believe, I think they're wrong, but I think that a lot of addicts genuinely believe that because their betrayed partners are angry and upset with them, that mm -hmm. like they, they can't bring it to like, like that they would be doing harm that, you know, that's just not a safe place to share that stuff. I think they, I think they're wrong. I want to be clear, but I do th think that it's a sincere belief that some of them have, right? It's that it, 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 you are. So it's a human nature. And just like with her needing that safety, she's, you know, our primal instinct, the main reason for our brain, God gave us these amazing things called a brain, but the mm -hmm. main reason we were get the main purpose for the brain when we're born is survival. And, and you need to feel safe from the very first instinct of being able to cry when you're hungry as a baby, you get food, you're, you're cold, you cry, you get warmth, you, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Primal instincts are safety. Mm -hmm. And so 
if you're building up these old behaviors of ways that are unhealthy to create that safety, like lying, like hiding, like, you know, um, gaslighting, abuse, yelling, you're building up all these tools, unhealthy tools, and you're, I always call it, it's a bucket of unhealthy behaviors, but they're, they're there for safety. They're there to protect yourself. It's not a good way to protect yourself, but they're there. We all right. have a bucket of behaviors that we use for safety. And unfortunately, when you have a history of um, any kind of abuse or uh, trauma, usually you have some unhealthy ways of coping to get safe. And that, and that just kind of pulls me up to this. When it's an addict who is with somebody who maybe is okay because they're an addict themselves or so they feel safe telling them that things, they know they can leave that meeting and they're fine if they never see that person again, whatever the reason is, it's or even like a therapist. They can share things with a therapist because they know it's a safe environment. They're right. not going to get judged too bad. They may be hold, held accountable. Um, and, and sometimes I'll see people leave a therapist who's really, really good because the therapist will hold them accountable. Um, sure. But usually early recovery, you see a lot of guys in early recovery have that mentality of, oh, I can't share that with my wife. You want me to have a 24-hour rule to tell my wife if I slipped, are you crazy? She's going to go off on me. She's going to be angry. But what I try to tell them is, no, it's a good thing. It means that she can trust you're going to go to her if you're struggling. If she's finding out later, she's going to know you're not doing any recovery work. If you go to her and you show her that she is more important than the activity that you just took place, you know, that you were just acting out with, she's more important than any of that. That's going to build intimacy. So mm -hmm. I always say, you got to trust me on this. You don't want to hide things like that from your wife. You have to share it. And if she comes back because she's angry, guess what? That's okay. That's and you right. need to take it. You need to just take it. If she's angry, there's a reason for it. And I also will even go so far, dare I say, it's a gift if she's angry at you. It's a gift if she tells you what she needs. You need to take that because if she didn't love you, she would have been like, right. okay, whatever, I'm done. But the fact that there's some passion there, there's there's communication on her part about what she needs, those are little gifts for you. You may Absolutely. think they're negative, but if you didn't have them, she's out the door. Yeah. When you start seeing walls, and I'll see that happen too, they'll come in here and the walls are already built because he's not leaning in and showing empathy and communicating and being honest. And then he's slipping, he's not telling her, he's not doing the recovery work. Wall, 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 wall. And pretty soon that wall gets so thick that it's hard to break through. And I can't even break through it because she's like, no, I, this is my protection. He's not making me safe. So I am going to stand behind this wall. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, these are little gifts when she's telling you what she needs, you better take them and treasure them. Even though it's scary, even though there's fear there, you've got to find a way through that fear and know that there's going to be sunshine in the end. <laughs> you just got to get through it. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. It's hard. Yeah, I always tell guys, and I mean, this isn't original to me, but, you know, hate and anger is not the opposite of love, right? Apathy. Yeah, yeah, apathy yeah. is what we mm -hmm. what we get when love is gone. And so as yes. long as there's still these big reactions, that's a good one. That's that's a hopeful sign. She still it cares, is. right? Yes. She still cares. When when she gets to a place where she doesn't care. That's a worry. big problem there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I had a, I have a, a couple that I'm, I'm working with that um, she came to me because um, she has that wall. And so I see him separately and he, he's like, well, things are great. They, you know, she, she's not mad anymore. She's fine. And I'm like, are you sleeping in the same bed? No. <laughs> are you doing, yeah. are you going on dates? No. Are you talking? No, not really, unless it's about the kids or work. Okay, well, so is that the kind of marriage you think is healthy? Well, no, but she's just working through her trauma. She, you know, I think she'll come around. She'll be okay. Guess what, buddy? She's working through her trauma alone <laughs> right. without you. Right, and right. guess what that, guess what happens when you have to go through the trauma alone and yeah. you're not going through that grieving process with the person that hurt you, with your partner? And that person mm -hmm. isn't there to love you and to hold you through it. You're losing that. You're losing that opportunity for intimacy. 
you're losing that opportunity to build true trust and love. You're blowing it. You got to start getting hurt a little bit. You got to start. She was hurt for 20 years by your actions. It's okay if you get shot with a shame arrow every now and then, <laughs> because it just means that she's wanting that attention. She's wanting that love from you. She's wanting that support. And when she wants that support from you, that's a good sign that you guys could move forward from this. Yeah. But if she's not, she's closing down, then you're going to have to like step up the work even harder. Right. And, and, um, Another reality in that dynamic that I hear you describing there, Tiffany, and I would say this, if you're an addict out there, one who's done the betraying and you're hearing this, and you're like, yeah, that's hit a little close to home for me. That sounds a little familiar. Well, I, I would also just encourage you with this. One of the things that I, I believe we know, I'm going to use the word no, like I, this isn't even like theory anymore in my mind. One of the things that we know is that as individuals, my development as a person, my growth as a person happens in the context of relationships. And so I can't grow on my own. That's why I have to go to meetings. I have to have a sponsor. I have to, whatever it is. Well, these difficult moments with a betrayed partner, navigating the anger that also is just covering pain, navigating the fears that come out uh, with such such force and such bite navigating the mm -hmm. vulnerabilities of all of that. Yeah. It's hard, mm -hmm. but that's part of how you grow. That's yeah. part of how you become the person you want to be. You know, that's part of what it means to be recovered and in recovery. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's not just what's best for your partner, but it's also what's best for your relationship and you, you, there, yeah. I, I, I love working with the addicts that I always say, you know, I, I have empathy for what you're going through. This is the toughest addiction to kick. It is mm -hmm. hard work and you hurt somebody that you love dearly and deeply. Right. And so now you're having to do two jobs. You're having to heal yourself and you're going to have to help her and the couple heal. But somebody that gives me that buy-in and they are like, they really start doing the work. They're not just saying the words. I have mad respect for an addict who is doing sure. work. I Absolutely. will tell them, you will be my favorite client if you <laughs> just do the work, please. I think it's amazing. And I see, I think, I don't remember who was saying it, maybe Carol Sheets was saying that um, and any person that, were, whether they're an addict or not, but anybody that goes through the program for yeah. sex addiction and does the work, they're going to be better, healthier, have more integrity, more stable, um, appreciate life better, have a better life in general than 85% of regular population of men. Right. That's 85% healthier if you were a sex addict and you went through the program and you did everything right and you learned about what's in here and you learned how to be healthy and you learned how to love yourself, which is, which is huge. You know, it's huge sure. part of sex addiction. That's that right. Love is missing. And so they have to learn how to love themselves and to be able to put the shame aside and somebody that can do that. It's going to take a lot of work, but if they can do it. That's an amazing person right there. That person is somebody that you could stay with that you can trust. So right. I always say, I look at them and I'm like, I want you to be that one. Yeah. I really want you to be that one. We will work together. I will help you get, if you don't have a CSAT or a therapist, you need a trauma therapist, whatever you need, I will help you find it, but let's figure out a plan. But you got to promise me you're going to stick to it. Mm. Not give up because this is a right. long process. This right. takes years. Yes. But it's yeah. worth it. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. so let's think of another, uh, here's another situation, uh, sometimes, uh, with addicts that aren't necessarily wanting to do the work or do some of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, stuff they need to do. So that's when an addict is really, really set on the other person's part, right? Mm. Their part um, that they've got a part to play in this. And they, what about what they've done? And, and even to the point of, of justifying and rationalizing some of their own acting out as being in response to what their partners did do or didn't do. 
Um, yeah. which, yeah. which we know is so, so damaging. It just adds another yeah. layer of damage to the betrayed partner. So I'm curious, let's start with this. What would you tell the partner of an addict who's doing that? Yeah. So, um, I use, <laughs> my clients will laugh if they see this, but I use the term crazy train. Um, don't get on that crazy train. He's yeah. just at the, usually it's, uh, usually not always, they either haven't had the right kind of therapy, the right kind of direction. Um, they don't get it. So they're still using tools in that bucket, like deflection, gaslighting. Um, I'm, I'm trying to put the attention off of what I did because I'm ashamed of what I did. I want her to move forward. I want her to move past it. I just want to forget about it because I don't, I don't want to be that way anymore. I want to be good. Right. Um, unfortunately for her, it's so fresh and real. And she, there's no way she can feel safe and know what's going on up here with him. So I tell her, listen, he's going to have this mentality for a little bit, but you and I are going to stay st stand strong in your recovery and you're going to have to learn some boundaries here with him. But do not jump on his crazy train. Do not listen to what he's saying. If he's deflecting or, or trying to make it about you, mm. this was not your fault. Period. Yeah. This is not your fault. You did not deserve this. So let's just work on you and hopefully he will come around. But right now I'm 99% sure this is based on his shame and based on an ego. Usually, um, the shame and the ego go hand in hand usually. Uh, and, and it isn't about you. It's, it's about him. So hopefully we can get him to a point where he's going to be able to work with, with a professional that can help him see that. But for right now, we're just going to work on empowering yourself and um, being able to move forward. And we're going to work on boundaries. Uh, we're going to right. build that safety plan. Um, she's got to get her voice back. Right. And, yeah. and you know, what I would say to the addict in that, scenario and that could be a whole show episode right there I was so we say, can't go into it too deeply that. we really don't <laughs> I but I, like, here's go there? here's what i what i will say in case any are listening what i'll say is that i i've literally worked with hundreds of addicts at this point maybe yeah. thousands in one capacity or another but what i have noticed is that when you get further down that road of recovery and you get more and more clarity, it's amazing how addicts st suddenly start to look back and go, oh, maybe, <laughs> oh, yes. I thought it was about mm -hmm. she didn't want sex, but why would she want to have sex with that guy, the person I was, right? How I was showing up or whatever, you know, and, and, uh, they just, they seem to get some clarity in the rear view mirror. So if you're listening and you're, uh, an addict and you're thinking about your partner's part of this, just, just oh watch gosh. your words. Cause they I'll may come back and bite thing. you. Yeah. Go I'm going to say one more thing on that. So there's a cycle I, and see that dry erase board right over there. I use this uh -huh, all the time yeah. or I'll use it on zoom, but um, there's a cycle that they'll get on a lot of times with couples where he'll say, well, she's not doing the dishes and cleaning the house. She just sits around and cries all day. So it <laughs> makes me depressed. So I act out because I'm not getting what I need from her. She doesn't need all my needs. And then she's like, well, I'm doing that because he's acting out and he's looking at other women and he's having affairs and he's looking. And so I'm depressed. I feel bad about myself. So I, I can't even get off the couch. And so there's this cycle and they're both responding to the other person. Right. And then I look at the addict and I'll draw it out and I'll put her name here and his name here and we'll go round and round. And I go, who do you think needs to jump off this cycle first? And he usually, I don't think I've ever had one that said her, usually yeah. goes, uh, that's me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm, I'll do yeah. it. Okay. And they usually get it. But most of the time, those are trauma responses and, or their responses to just being abused, mm -hmm. quite frankly. And so, um, I also will also tell them couples therapy is for future. <laughs> we need to deal with recovering from the betrayal first and her feeling safe before we bring in couples therapy. And that includes learning how to communicate really early on, learning, learning how to check in, learning empathy on both sides. And eventually couples therapy is right. later. 
if you jump into couples therapy too soon, she's going to feel blamed more than likely. He's going to feel validated more than likely. It just doesn't work. So I yep. always say, well, I get a lot of them that come to me after they've had couples therapy and they're like, oh my gosh, it was awful. So right. we, we just, right. I think couples therapy is amazing. I love it. Um, but there's a time and a place for that right sure. now. We gotta, we're in urgent care. That's, that's right. Bleeding that's right. right got to stop the bleed. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one last, one last question I have for you. Okay. So we've talked a lot about empathy. It keeps coming up. How, how, uh, uh, an addict or one who did betraying really needs to show empathy through to their partners. But what if, what if they feel threatened? How do you show empathy to someone mm -hmm. who, who's threatening you, who you feel yeah. threatened by, right? Like, you know, <laughs> she's yelling a lot or, you know, mm -hmm. she's, she's saying she's going to leave me or divorce me or tell my family everything or whatever. How do you show empathy in that situation? Yeah. I had somebody use the example. She's a porcupine. I go in and I yeah. try to pet her and it's like, I get poked every time, mm -hmm. you know, I want to show her empathy, but I can't because I'm afraid she's going to throw a, a shame arrow at me. And so again, kind of revisiting that cycle. Um, I, I get them centered on a lot of times I'll get them after they've been in recovery four or five years and they, the wife hasn't moved on at all and she's stuck, uh, because she has never felt like she can express how she's feeling without him leaving. He'll just mm. split. He's like, I don't want to hear it because she, all she's doing is abusing me and yelling me at me about what I did. But I always explain to him, well, have you ever tried this empathy thing? Have you tried that? Well, no, because I'm afraid to. Okay, give it a try. Yeah, you might, you you need to, Carol Sheets uses Teflon. I use uh, plexiglass as an example. You may need to stand behind the plexiglass or spray some Teflon spray on for the first few times you do this because she's not used to you leaning in and trying to help her through it. Um, and when I do couples work, I will tell her, you got to give him some grace at this empathy thing. It's not going to be great at first. This is brand new for him. So allow him to show you some empathy if you can. Um, give him a little bit of grace. Let him try it out. Don't shoot an arrow at him right away. Just let him try it. Um, sometimes she just can't. She's hurting so bad because he's never heard her. Yeah. She's never had that chance to tell him right. how it's impacted her right. because he always flees. At the first sign of distress, he leaves. And he doesn't want to be in it. He doesn't. And the more you do that, the more time that goes on, you flee over and over again, the, the more resentment she builds up, the sharper those arrows are going to be because she doesn't feel like you care. Right. You're the one that hurt her and deceived her. And now you're fleeing when she tries to get help from you. Right. So of course she's going to have resentment and anger and that's normal. Again, yeah. there's a gift. You're given a gift. Go in. Spray the Teflon on and go in and help her. Do not leave her in that dark hole alone. You go in there. She might be like, you know, scratching your eyes out, but that's okay. <laughs> she will eventually know that you're a safe person that she can come to. And the more you can show her empathy over time, the less empathy she's really going to need because she's going to feel safer. She's going to understand that you get it. You're never going to fully understand the pain that she's been in. But part of her will start to soften because she's like, okay, at least he's trying to make me feel better and he's trying to make up for it. Yes. Um, so it, it's just getting off that cycle first. That's right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's yeah. good stuff. Well, Tiffany, thank you so much for coming back to Betrayal Recovery yeah. Radio. Of course. Yeah. It's so good you to know, uh, be with you. If you folks, too. If folks want to find you, I mean, we'll put all the links in the show notes, but tell them where they yeah. can email you or call you or reach yeah, you. Yeah. So I, I see clients all over the country, all over the world, really. I have, I have one in um, London, okay. uh, Hawaii, all over the country. Yeah. Cause I, um, I don't, I'm a coach so I can go everywhere virtually. Right. <laughs> um, and yeah, to find me, my company name is hope which stands for healing is optimal through personal empowerment. Um, and you go to hope CFL, like central Florida, CFL, hope CFL.com. You'll see all my contact information. I'm based out of Orlando, Florida. So if you're in Florida, I do, I have an office and I do in person as well. Um, I also do disclosures in person. So I have people come in from all over the country 
to do a full therapeutic disclosure with a polygraph here in this office. So I do a lot of in person, but uh, you know, we live in a day yeah. and age where thank goodness we have things like Zoom. That's right. I can go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. But go to my website. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tiffany. It's great to be with you. Love the work that you do. And uh, you take good care. Jake. All right. You too. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of AppSAT. If you've received help or hope from this episode, I encourage you to share it with someone you know. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jake Porter, and you can always email me directly at jake at appsats.org. I'd love to hear your ideas, questions, or comments about the show. Until next time, keep choosing to use your voice and live your values. It's good for you and for this world.